Welcome everyone. We're just going to give us all a few minutes to uh, get everyone into the webinar here before we get started. Good morning, Danielle. So it's nine, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, so this of course is a webinar and uh, you will not be seen or heard sadly, only only our pan panelists will be seen and heard, um, but we do invite you to participate in in, uh, in the sessions throughout and we'll walk through how, how to go about doing that. So good morning and welcome to the California Irrigation Institute Conference. My name is Carrie Pollard and I represent Marin Water. We're here in our 59th year of this conference, and I'm really pleased and honored to have been the 2020 California Irrigation Institute president. We were all really hopeful that uh, by 2021, you know, February 1st, 2021, we'd be able to gather together to catch up with old friends and make some new acquaintances, but that will just have to wait. Um, and for now, we will continue with the new virtual reality by spending a few mornings together on Zoom. The links you use today um, to access the conference will be um, what you'll use tomorrow as well. And uh, we'll walk through how to get to access to the, the urban sessions and the ag sessions um, at the end of this joint panel. Although the format is a webinar, we do invite you to participate in the conference. Um, you can use the chat function if you'd like to make a comment or use the Q&A functions that are, that are there in your control panels. Um, if you'd like to ask questions, uh, if you do use the Q&A, your questions will be answered either live or within the Zoom platform. Um, some of the presentations will actually incorporate polling. Um, so we're gonna get started with our first poll. Uh, Tia can cue that up. Uh, we'd like to, to know um, what option best represents you as a participant of CII. Um, we have representatives from agriculture and water utilities and, and various vendors, um, and of course our students. At CII, we really pride ourselves in providing meaningful educational opportunities for our student participants. And we generally have poster sessions and networking events. Um, and uh, we you know, get to banter with them over lunch and enjoy our conference chicken. But of course, that will have to wait. None of that will be happening this year. But I do want to encourage not only our student participants, but all of our participants to, um, to you know, participate in the program, all of our attendees to participate in the program via the Q&A function. Hopefully by 2022, we'll all be back and be able to, uh, to gather and enjoy that conference chicken. Um, so let's see the results there, Tia. Do we have them queued up? Awesome. All right, well, great showing uh, for the early morning ag um, folks. We have 57% and then uh, followed closely by, by uh, wholesale and retail, water retailers, which is wonderful. See if we have any, no students are on yet. They're probably, you know, making their way getting their coffee. <clears throat> so I hope you had a chance to look over the agenda for this morning, for the morning sessions, and then also tomorrow morning sessions as well. We're really pleased to bring you a regulatory update on the water conservation framework, which will happen later this morning in the urban session. And then we also have an international panel um, with the ag session, which is really exciting, um, which is a great lead into our next poll, which is um, where, where are you from? Where are you joining us from? We want to know, you know, if you're, uh, we are the California Irrigation Institute, if you're located here in California or outside or perhaps international. Um, while we wait for those responses, I just want to take a moment to thank our platinum sponsors, platinum and gold sponsors for their long-standing support. These of course include CoBank, Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, Water and Land Solutions, and Yosemite Farm Credit. Uh, we appreciate their continued support and support from all of our CI sponsors during these trying times. Um, they all really are, are, are what makes this happen, makes it happen for, for all of you. And thank you, Tia, such timing with the poll. Uh, Northern California's strong representation. 
Um, and again, none of our international folks are, 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 are on this morning, but um, I know they'll be joining us later um, for, those, for, their, for their panels. And for our final poll, um, we want to know how many CII con conferences have you attended? I mentioned we're in our 59th year, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and we do have some folks who have, have sh you know, come for, for many decades. Um, and, and we just would like to get a little bit of information on who is in attendance. Um, while we do that, I will just mention that you can receive CEUs, continuing education units for participating in the CII conference this year. Um, we have received approval from the Irrigation Association and the Qualified Water Efficient Landscaper Program for CEUs. Um, and you'll use your, your email confirmation of registration as, um, as your proof of attendance. Um, and, and they've already um, approved that. And so, so you can um, just use that email. And what do we have here, T, as far as our polling? Oh, one to five, the majority, excellent. 10% though is over 20. Wonder um, how many of those folks have come for many, many decades. Um, we'll have to check in them with them next year when we're all, we're all together, hopefully again. All right, thank you, Tia. So we're gonna actually move into um, the meat of our program now. Um, we're going to start with our keynote speaker, which will be provided by Wade Crowfoot, uh, California's Natural Resource Secretary. For the last two years, Secretary Crowfoot has overseen the state of California's forest and natural lands, rivers and waterways, coast and ocean, fish and wildlife, and energy development. As a member of the governor's cabinet, he advises the governor on natural resources and environmental issues. Secretary Crowfoot is a bit of a water guy. Prior to leading the Natural Resource Agency, he served as the chief executive officer for the Water Foundation, which is a nonprofit that builds shared water solutions across the American West. And um, many years ago, I actually received a grant from the Water Foundation, so I'm fully aware of the good work they do, and I'm really pleased um, to have Wade with us this morning. Um, without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and start his pre-recorded presentation. Uh, please submit your questions in the Q&A, and then uh, we'll, he will be available for um, live question and answer following this presentation. That introduction and the opportunity to uh, really start off or invoke the Institute's convening here today. Uh, obviously, so many important topics to discuss on all things water. And uh, the timing is appropriate uh, up for this discussion considering just the intense rain and snow we've had over recent days. And the fact that at the same time, we're in a period of uh, prolonged dry conditions. Uh, so the work that you all do, whether you're in an urban water agency or in an urban community or an agriculture producer or agriculture irrigation district is, is really critical. To start off the discussion today, I just wanted to share some thoughts uh, broadly on, on water in California and then more specifically on the topics you'll cover today. I think as many of you know, uh, under Governor Newsom, we established a water resilience portfolio uh, that is really guiding our state agency's work. And the goal uh, with this portfolio is to take uh, a holistic approach across our various agencies. Uh, our natural resource agency, of, of course, includes the Department of Water Resources and Fish and Wildlife. Uh, our sister agency across Sacramento, uh, Cal EPA, includes the Water Board. And so this water resilience portfolio is really the Newsom administration's playbook or roadmap um, to build uh, our state's resilience to drought and flooding. Now we know that uh, both of those phenomena are naturally occurring in our ecology, but we also know that climate change is uh, creating more pervasive uh, hurtful droughts and uh, potentially more dangerous flooding. Uh, and so we think we have to do more as state agencies to support all of your work uh, to build resilience. Uh, and we recognize that really strengthening water reliability, uh, restoring natural environments, uh, building this climate resilience in the water sector really differs across the state. So what works in the North Coast obviously is very different than the Inland Empire. So our focus is really trained on doing what we can to support regional leadership. Um, building uh, resilience. So that obviously includes uh, supporting diversifying supplies of water. 
So not only uh, identifying how to store more water underground or in surface storage, but also expanding uh, recycling of water. And as you'll talk about today, capturing uh, this storm surge, capturing storm water um, for uh, use again, and also to pre prevent uh, harmful runoff. Um, so we think that there's a lot of work that can happen across the state uh, to be better about uh, actually diversifying our, our water supplies. And of course, we're gonna need to do that uh, given the implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and less reliable uh, water supplies from our natural cycle uh, due to climate change. We also think there's a really critical role to uh, increase and improve efficiency uh, in, in all uh, sort of uh, sections of uh, water delivery. Uh, in the, on the urban side, uh, we think that uh, urban communities can do more to squeeze out that water waste. Oftentimes it gets used on outdoor irrigation for ornamentals uh, in yards. Um, so as you know, we're actively implementing legislation um, and law change um, that requires more focus um, among urban water agencies to improve uh, water efficiency. Uh, and likewise, we think on the agricultural space um, and agricultural parts of California, there's great opportunity to get more pop for the drop, um, as you all know, whether it's uh, improving the efficiency of irrigation systems, which is near and dear to the Institute's heart, uh, or improving the quality and the organic content in soil, so-called healthy soil, to maximize water retention for the benefit of uh, producing crops. Uh, so we think that there's a lot that can be done uh, to improve our efficiency, uh, help our water uh, go further. And the state obviously has a role in that, uh, whether that's uh, increasing funding for our SWEEP program, our state water efficient energy and uh, water efficiency program, SWEEP through the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Likewise, um, Karen Ross's Department of Food and Agriculture also uh, administers the Healthy Soils program. Governor Newsom's uh, most recent proposed budget uh, uh, outlined earlier this month calls for increased funding for both SWEEP uh, and for the Healthy Soils Program. Uh, likewise, we need to do more to support local implementation of SIGMA. So Governor Newsom's proposed budget uh, currently being considered by the legislature also calls for an additional uh, $60 million uh, in funding to be distributed by water resources to local groundwater management agencies. So there's a lot that can obviously be done uh, through these state and local regional partnerships to improve efficiency. We're also really bullish on the role of technology uh, in improving the way that we use uh, and manage water. And we, we have recognized the power of technology both in the urban and the rural context. In the urban context, the example I always like to give uh, are these water smart programs, uh, which is essentially like a software service that some urban agencies have, have brought or used that allow consumers to understand their water use uh, compared to uh, folks in their neighborhood with comparable yards and comparable homes. I can still remember vividly living in Oakland during the last drought and having our East Bay mud uh, send emails that would give me a smiley face or a frown depending on how my water usage compares to my neighbors. And in one instance, we actually had a leak that we weren't aware of and the smile went to a frown uh, and helped us identify the leak and get it repaired. So that's emblematic of the way that we can apply technology in the urban context. And then of course, in the agricultural context or the rural context, I'm really excited about the work on um, remote sensing for evapotranspiration or ET. Uh, and as I understand it, there's been some really interesting partnerships between agricultural producers and even NASA and some uh, other nonprofit groups to really help understand how evapotranspiration of agricultural production can be measured remotely uh, from far away as satellites, believe it or not, that can help uh, farmers and ranchers manage their water usage uh, more effectively. Likewise, uh, earlier this fall, we announced a partnership with NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory or NASA JPL. Uh, you may know that is part of NASA based in Pasadena down south uh, that launches many of our satellites into space. And those satellites obviously explore the, the solar system and the universe, but they also uh, actually can measure uh, many aspects of our um, planetary health. 
uh, including the level of groundwater underground. And as I mentioned, the evapotranspiration, uh, they can tell us where um, vegetation uh, in our forests is overly dense. They can also help us understand conditions in our oceans. And so uh, Governor Newsom called for this partnership with NASA JPL, and we're gonna be bringing more of this uh, technology through collected through JPL satellites actually into uh, state government. We're also announcing actually this week uh, a new data platform that we'll uh, be establishing across our state agencies called California Nature or CA Nature. And that uh, is being developed in a partnership with Esri, which you may know is a California company that is really sort of foremost GIS data company in the world. And what we're doing um, through the development of that platform is aggregating or bringing together all sorts of data uh, that's presented geospatially. So we'll be able to show a map at very high resolution of all of the state uh, that can be zoomed in that identifies environmental values of our land and water. This will advance an effort uh, which we are undertaking uh, called 30 by 30 to conserve 30% of California by 2030. And that CA Nature uh, geospatial platform um, with environmental data is going to be open source or op available publicly. Um, so we're hoping it actually is a uh, piece of technology um, that you all may be able to use or at least consult with uh, to manage water and your own lands. So we're really excited with, with all that's happening. Um, we're deeply thankful to the work that all of you do. I think we can all agree this last several months has been a challenging and uncertain time. But amidst that, um, what we have been able to take for granted, frankly, is the continued availability of food uh, produced uh, by our farmers and ranchers in California. What we have been able to take for granted is the delivery of clean and safe water uh, for the vast majority of California, thanks to our water agencies. So the work you do is central to, you know, continuing to allow uh, prosperity uh, across our state, and we're really thankful. Lastly, I'll say we're really interested in better, better understanding what else we need to do in state agencies to support your work. So as uh, the conversation unfolds uh, today and over this convening, um, we'll be interested to follow up uh, with the Institute to really better understand what can state agencies, state departments, uh, do to actually support your work, um, building more efficiency in our water usage and ultimately more resilience in our water system. So huge thanks again for the opportunity to be here today and I look forward to answering any questions or hearing any suggestions you may have. Thanks so much. Um, that, was, that was a great intro and you covered so many topics that we will be covering during this conference, which is really nice. And we do have a couple of questions that have come in. I just wanna make sure your mic works, are you good? Yep, sure thing. P perfect. All right, so um, how is the governor's office planning to engage local communities to implement the water um, resilience portfolio? It's a great point. First of all, I'd say thanks for the opportunity to be here uh, and to record that message. And it was great to see sort of the uh, distribution of participants here today. Uh, I would say if you uh, care about what we're doing or, you know, either think it could be helpful or hurtful, actually take it, take time to to check out the water resilience portfolio. So if you Google, you know, California water resilience portfolio, you'll find it. And we tried to make the document uh, understandable and clear and focused. So we have a number of specific actions that uh, are called for under uh, three or four main categories. Uh, and so I would say, first of all, just understand, you know, what we're working to hold ourselves accountable for. Uh, secondly, we have a key member of our team in the resources agency that spends her time coordinating uh, the agency's implementation of this. And when I say agencies, I mean Cal EPA, Food and Agriculture, Natural Resources, and others. And her name is Nancy Vogel. You, you, some of you may know Nancy Vogel, but Nancy Vogel is always reachable if you identify uh, an action and want to better under, that we have in the water resilience portfolio and want to better understand um, actually how we're implementing it. And then we're planning to uh, provide a, an annual update on our implementation of these various actions and periodic convenings. 
Uh, and so, for example, we gave an update to the Association of California Water Agencies, or ACWA, at the most recent uh, convening that they had across the state. So we'll be organizing at the resources agency periodic updates. If you want those periodic updates, uh, we have a listserv that you can join uh, for uh, our, our agency to better understand when those happen. And then lastly, if you are, uh, if your district or a set of districts or, or stakeholders um, want to have a meeting or are holding a similar convening to today and want an update, we welcome the opportunity to provide uh, an update or go deep on certain topics. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I, you'll probably get some uh, invitations based on that comment. That's good. Um, another question came in. Um, how do you suggest agricultural irrigators coordinate with local GSAs to improve water use efficiency while still promoting groundwater recharge? That's a really good question. Well, one is we're working to support groundwater management agencies to uh, find ways to improve efficiency of irrigation, because obviously that can be very helpful if a, a local community is uh, facing reduced use of groundwater on an annual basis in order to bring a groundwater basin into sustainability over the next 20 years, the more efficient use of agriculture, of irrigation can be really important. Um, so, uh, and that's why the governor, uh, I think doubled or tripled the proposed budget for our SWEET program to get grants uh, to locals. And I think there may be uh, an interest in targeting the SWEET funding uh, to groundwater basins that are in greatest need uh, because of Sigma. Uh, and then, uh, Secondly, I would say we're working with the local groundwater management agencies to make uh, flood recharge or aquifer recharge easier within the flood season. And so the water board has been working to improve its processes to make it a lot easier actually to get those recharge projects going. And I saw on social media just this weekend um, that there were a number of recently initiated groundwater recharge projects that are actually happening. Um, as it relates to how irrigators interact with the, the local groundwater management agencies, I'm not sure if there's any one template for that. You know, Sigma, very much the spirit of Sigma is this sort of localized leadership. So I would say it probably differs um, by, by districts. But I would say this, if you're an irrigation district and you have a suggestion around how the state can support, uh, you know, expanded irrigation efficiency or, you know, better integration of irrigation efficiency into groundwater management, let us know. We, don't, we want to avoid a heavy-handed approach and, and let locals really lead the implementation of their groundwater sustainability plans, but we're always, we're always interested in how the state can actually um, support those efforts to bring groundwater basins into, into sustainable uh, use. Right, great, thank you. Uh, we have a, a question on the urban side. So you mentioned the 30% by 2030. Can you expand on this? And will it be at will it be at odds with the water use targets that are currently being developed? Yeah. So just to be clear, the the so-called thirty by thirty goal that that governor has established and actually President Biden established last week for the country is to conserve thirty percent of California's land and coastal waters by twenty thirty. That's not only sort of protecting wilderness areas, but improving conservation on land across the state. Um, that may have some impact on water districts, um, not from a regulatory perspective, but it might provide some opportunities to uh, ensure that, for example, protected watersheds are conserved in a way <clears throat> that's beneficial to the environment, and there may be incentives to do that. That's really on the land conservation side. What I was referring to as it relates to urban uh, irrigation or urban water efficiency are the bills that passed oh, about five years ago that require uh, urban water agencies to develop these plans to reduce water waste. And I know that implementation is happening through the Department of Water Resources. And I think the biggest challenge for locals will be to meet those standards uh, and specifically to reduce uh, water waste, uh, for example, for outdoor uh, ornamental you know, vegetation. But uh, so to meet those standards in the law, but in ways that maintain flexibility. Um, we recognize that it can't be a one-size-fits-all. Different urban districts have different opportunities and different needs, different areas of flexibility and rigidity. So we're working to implement that law in a manner that really encourages urban agencies to squeeze out that water waste, but in a way that works for their own communities. Great. Yes, water waste is something we definitely need to continue to address, and the targets will certainly... Uh touch on that. 
Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Um, similar, uh, what do you see as the greatest challenge for municipalities in implementing the new water use efficiency regulations that you just mentioned? Um, I would say, I would say that it's just really it, working with water resources to make sure that the regulations to implement the law uh, are workable. I think the law is very clear that you know, state legislators and the, and I think Governor Brown, who signed the law, were clear that, you know, last drought was a great example that there is more efficiency uh, to be achieved from urban water agencies, and we want to make conservation a way of life. So really, that's the kind of the North Star of the legislation. Um, but obviously, important details in those, in those regulations that DWR is developing uh, and local water agencies will need to ensure that, though, that the standards that DWR sets and frankly the rules uh, that DWR sets actually are workable. Uh, so I think that there's been good progress that's made that's been made. Um, and it you know will and so I, I'm optimistic, but obviously you know we just have to work together, locals, uh, agencies and state agencies to ensure those urban efficiency standards are workable. Right, similar to the GSAs, right? Having local control. Very totally. Important. Um, let's see, I think, so that's all the questions we have. Oh, sorry, Gary. No, no. Go ahead. I was gonna say, I think, you know, I think the key takeaway of all the work we did on the water resilience portfolio and all the input that we got is, you know, in, improving water resilience across the state is not a one size fits all solution from Sacramento. It's achieved on a local and regional basis. And as I mentioned in my talk, you know, the opportunities and challenges are really different across the state. So we're working as a, at the state level to have the discipline within our agencies to understand really the role we play, you know, as a funder, as a standard setter, as a developer of projects that are, that are greater than any local or, or regional agency, uh, and to really ultimately be proactive partners. I mean, our success uh, is your success in across California achieving, you know, water reliability, for example, on the local and regional level. Yes, very good. Uh, do you have any final closing comments? I think we've addressed all the questions that have come in so far. Well, I just wanna thank everybody. I mean, it, it is true that this past year has been uh, unexpected and really challenging, but for the most part, you know, most Californians have been able to take for granted the fact that they get clean and safe water into their homes and uh, our agriculture industry, which is really the breadbasket of the world or nation, uh, has been able to continue to, you know, deliver food amidst really challenging circumstances. So uh, I, I have a partial understanding of all of the challenges that's provided, but, uh, but certainly I don't fully understand everything that you've had to do. So I just want to thank you, you know, on behalf of, of Californians that, that benefit from the water and food. Very good. Thank you so much for participating and and uh, being part of our, our our opening our opening panel and our and our keynote speaker. We really appreciate your your time. Thanks, Carrie. Good luck. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Um. So, water in California really continues to pose new challenges and uh, force creative solutions. So we seem to have more extreme weather patterns and with prolonged dry months and then the you know extreme atmospheric rivers bringing a huge amount of storm water that we, you know, then need to deal with, um, which is continuing to pose new challenges. Um, for our opening panel, we will address the opportunities to leverage storm water as a water supply. Uh, we're uh, titled it "Only Happy When It Rains," which is, which is, uh, which is, I thought was was great because each of our presenters will will have a different perspective on on uh, how they're happy when it rains. Um, so, starting our panel today is the Local Government Commission's very own Danielle Dolan. At LGC, Ms. Dolan's current projects include updating the Awani Water Principles Guide, developing community-wide approach to stormwater management, and assisting local municipalities to address barriers in implementing low-impact development. So her, her talk will actually be on low-impact development. Um, all of our panelists are in attendance, and they are here and ready to answer your questions in the Q&A function. Uh, so please continue to use that as you have been. And with that, we will, um, we'll turn over to William to start um, Danielle's presentation.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Danielle Dolan. I'm the Water Program Director for the Local Government Commission, and I'm here today to speak with you about creative approaches to low impact development during these unprecedented uncertain times that we live in. William, you mean just need to advance this first slide. With an arrow. Please hold, we're having technical difficulties. <laughs> For those of you who are not yet familiar with LGC, we're a Sacramento-based nonprofit that's been working with community leaders across the state to help them increase their resilience and livability. We've been operating for nearly 40 years now, and we build this resilience by connecting leaders, advancing policy, and implementing solutions at both the local and statewide scale. We focus on four core program areas, climate, energy, water, and community design. LGC also runs an AmeriCorps national service program called Civic Spark, which places recent college graduates in local public agencies across the state to build capacity and advance community resilience goals. Our water program addresses complex issues at the nexus of water management and land use planning, which is why I'm here talking to you all about stormwater. So let's get into it. Real quick, here's what I'll be sharing with you all over the next 25 minutes or so. First, I'll cover the basics. What exactly is LID and why does it matter? Then I'll explore the many reasons why we should all be implementing more LID in our communities. Finally, I'll leave you with some guidance on how to make sure your LID projects are successful. And I'll sprinkle in a few real world examples along the way. We are indeed living in a time of uncertainty. Climate change impacts, racial unrest, political unrest, economic distress, limited budgets, aging infrastructure, greater demand on all of our resources, both natural and social. When we're facing new and difficult challenges, they exceed our ability to address those challenges with business as usual approaches. Therefore, we need to get creative. We have to use what limited resources we have as efficiently as possible and address multiple needs with every dollar, every drop of water, every square foot of land. That's exactly what low impact development strives to do. Throughout this presentation, I'll be referring to both LID or low impact development and green infrastructure, abbreviated GI. These are very similar concepts, often used interchangeably, but there is some nuance. The terms themselves are somewhat intuitive. Low impact development, LID, generally refers to the built environment, the developed environment. The low impact refers to the effects on our natural environment from our social economic development. LID is a total site design approach that conserves and uses existing natural site features and systems integrated with distributed small-scale stormwater management controls. These are also known as BMPs or best management practices. And these BMPs mimic or recreate the natural water balance in hydrology. These controls are integrated into all aspects of development and community design, including streets, parking, homes, buildings, parks, public spaces, and landscaped areas. While LID often incorporates natural environmental components to achieve its stormwater goals, it can also apply to man-made physical structures and traditional engineering solutions, which we often refer to as gray infrastructure. What makes it LID is that it's either mimicking natural processes or it's reducing negative environmental impacts, or both. Green infrastructure, on the other hand, is slightly different. 
the term is both more narrowly defined than LID and also has broader applications than LID. If you asked a fifth grader what green infrastructure is, they'd likely say infrastructure that is green. And that's actually pretty accurate. Green infrastructure is using natural physical features and ecological processes to achieve a desired human environmental outcome. GI can refer to whole landscape scale applications such as meadow carbon sequestration, hilltop fog harvesting, on-farm groundwater recharge, or tree grove air pollution reduction. It can also refer to distributed site level techniques similar to low impact development, but specific to the natural environmental features, such as a bioswale or a rain garden to capture and filter stormwater runoff. LID and GI help address and prevent some of the unintended consequences of the built environment. Judging by today's audience, I'm sure most of you are fairly familiar with the unintended consequences I'm referring to. Our historic approach to urban development, predominantly the vast expansion of impervious surfaces, has led to increases in both stormwater and dry, water, dry weather runoff, causing erosion, localized flooding, and infrastructure degradation. It's also caused high levels of non-point source pollution entering our waterways, harming aquatic ecosystems and public health, and reducing the ability of our water to percolate back into the soils and recharge the aquifers. This also leads to soil degradation, ecosystem decline, and reduced groundwater levels. Finally, urban development also causes urban heat island effect, degrades air quality, causes impacts to public health, and exacerbates localized climate change threats. Historically, we viewed stormwater and dry water dry weather runoff as a nuisance waste product and flood risk. Dry weather runoff is what comes off of people's driveways and streets when they hose down their cars or overfill their swimming pools or any other excess water use that ends up in our roads and our stormwater system that's not from rain. Communities and infrastructure were designed to get the water off the property as quickly as possible. Get it out of the way, out of sight. This is also known as collect, convey, and discharge. Efficiency was the highest priority. Now we're reversing that think thinking. To prevent some of those unintended consequences that I already referred to, stormwater managers now strive to interrupt that flow, slowing it down, distributing it across the landscape, allowing that water to percolate into the ground at a more natural rate. This is often called slow it, spread it, sink it. The philosophy of both low impact development and green infrastructure are inherently multi-benefit and cross-disciplinary. The process is designed to include input from urban planners, architects, civil engineers, hydrologists, geologists, biologists, landscape architects, sometimes even other specialists like ecologists, water quality experts, geomorphologists, and any other ologists you can think of. This is especially the case if sensitive habitat resources are involved. Initially, stormwater LID focused on water quality and flood mitigation, but in more recent years, we've been turning to stormwater as an alternative source of water supply too. This is an example of a large scale percolation basin underneath a recreational park in Modesto, a small Central Valley city. The project addressed local flooding, eliminating storm sewer overages, and treating stormwater. It also reduced pollution, pollutant loads, increased groundwater recharge, reduced treatment plant costs, and increased public awareness about stormwater. Now that everyone at least has a foundation of what LID is, we'll walk through some of the reasons why we should all be doing more of it. I'll cover the many benefits of LID, some recent-ish policy changes, and opportunities to leverage statewide policy priorities for more LID and GI projects. At its core, LID stretches our resources, using our land resources more economically and for multiple benefits, and protects our water resources. I couldn't possibly cover all of the environmental, social, and economic benefits of green infrastructure and the LID approach in such a short time, so I'll just highlight a few of them. 
The graphic in the center of this slide group groups. A great multi-benefit stormwater project example is the Colgan Creek in the city of Santa Rosa. Partnering with Trout Unlimited, they restored over 2,000 feet of an urban creek, connecting a local high school to a neighborhood that previously lacked sidewalks. Widening the stream width and improving riparian forest health has also improved stormwater quality and flow attenuation, and is increasing flood holdings. LID techniques have been required for both new and redevelopment projects by the state and regional water board since 2009 for larger cities. Those are over 100,000 people. And since 2013 for smaller cities, less than 100,000 people. This is under the MS4 permit program. MS4 stands for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. So an M with four S's. And this is how California administers the NPDES permit, National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, for non-point source pollution. It's managed by the State Water Board, issuing MS4 permits to municipalities under guidelines set by their regional boards. In 2012, AB 2311 initiated stormwater resource planning at the watershed scale, which was expanded in 2014 to include dry weather runoff and tying some Prop 1 funding eligibility to actually having a stormwater resource plan. The State Water Board established the STORMS program to provide guidance for stormwater resource planning and prioritizing stormwater capture, treatment, and reuse. So this is where we move from just treating stormwater into actually capturing it for reuse. And the STORMS program is an acronym for Strategy to Optimize Resource Management of Stormwater. The state loves its acronyms. Another recent development is a new financing tool that came out in 2014, Enhanced Infrastructure Financing Districts. This was developed to replace the dissolved redevelopment agencies. In 2017, the EIFD guidelines were amended to explicitly identify climate adaptation, including stormwater projects and green infrastructure, as eligible for tax increment financing. In 2018, it was further expanded to allow financing long-term maintenance costs, and then again in 2019 to remove the public vote requirement. EIFDs remove perhaps the most challenging barrier to LID, the question of how to actually pay for it. Even more recently, LA County passed Measure W in 2018, a parcel tax to fund comprehensive watershed scale stormwater capture and recycling. Many other communities are now considering something similar. Since the early 2000s, the state has prioritized multi-benefit projects. Virtually every grant program requires multiple benefits from any project. LID and green infrastructure align nicely with this priority, as I've already mentioned. The state has had a recycled water goal since 2009, to increase stormwater capture by 2 million acre feet by the year 2030. We're now only 10 years away from that goal. With the STORMS program, they've doubled down on this as a priority. In 2018, California voters passed Prop 68, the $4 billion Drought, Water, Parks, Climate, Coastal Protection, and Outdoor Access for All Act. Multiple stormwater grant programs are funded through this bond. And just last year, Governor Newsom released his water resilience portfolio, highlighting the need for multi-benefit green infrastructure projects for both water resource management and climate resilience. I'm sure many of you are at least somewhat aware of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. There is so much untapped potential for stormwater capture and recharge to address groundwater overdraft. Our next panelists, Dr. Andrew Fisher and Glenn Down, will cover that topic in more detail especially in the context of on-farm recharge. But it can also be a useful tool in urban and suburban settings, especially in large community parks and other open spaces like the Modesto example I shared. Now that you're all more aware of the benefits of LID and GI, and you see that it's clearly a priority for the state, I hope I've convinced you all that we should be implementing these practices more broadly. Every community, virtually every project site, 
should incorporate some LID features. Next, I'll share some of the ways you can increase your likelihood of success if you do pursue an LID or green, green infrastructure project. There are, of course, some barriers to low impact development and green infrastructure. In fact, LGC wrote a whole report on barriers to LID, including strategies to overcome them. Some of the most commonly cited challenges include, of course, you guessed it, cost, permitting and regulations, also long-term maintenance and the useful life of the project, and public reception of potential projects also come up as barriers. While all of these are valid concerns and can be quite complicated, they all can be overcome. With regard to cost, LID projects usually end up costing less than traditional gray infrastructure projects, especially when you factor it over the useful life of the project. For example, in 2015, the city of Newman installed a new 164 space parking lot for the Woodward Community Park. Using all LID design features, their team gained a 20% savings on installation costs, as well as long-term operations cost savings because there are no storm filters to maintain. Permitting and regulatory challenges can usually be overcome by engaging with your regional water board representative and all the relevant municipal department staff as early on in the process as possible. And practitioners are seeing more and more that the long-term maintenance of LID or GI systems is usually just as easy, if not more so, than maintaining their traditional gray stormwater infrastructure, once, of course, they learn how to do it and program it into their maintenance plans. In my experience, the greatest barrier of all is a lack of understanding or awareness, which leads to resistance. This too can be overcome by following some key principles. The Awani Water Principles is a set of nine community principles and five implementation measures developed by leading water experts from the national, state, and local level. They address concerns about stormwater runoff, flood damage liability, and the reliability of local water supplies by offering cost-saving stewardship actions. The five implementation principles in particular will help ensure project success. These implementation principles include consulting with relevant agencies, engaging stakeholders to collaborate, implementing best integrated strategies, ensuring that you involve the public, and monitoring and, and evaluating your projects. In addition to the principles themselves, LGC created an 80-page guidebook that provides case study examples and recommendations for actually implementing the principles. And that's available on our website, and I'll also link it at the end of this presentation. A great example of implementing the Awani Water Principles in the context of low-impact development is the City of Elk Grove's dry wells for stormwater infiltration, groundwater recharge, and climate adaptation. Dry wells are an effective method for capturing and storing stormwater runoff, if, especially if they're used in conjunction with other LID treatments. Dry wells help recharge the groundwater, which is a pressing need, especially during drought. The City of Elk Grove constructed two dry wells, one in a suburban neighborhood and another in an industrial parking lot, so they could monitor stormwater and groundwater quality during and after rain events. It's commonly feared that infiltrating stormwater into the aquifer will contaminate your groundwater supplies. But by monitoring this and ensuring adequate treatment of stormwater as it's infiltrating, they're hoping to dispel these concerns about contaminating the water supply. Because the Central Valley has clay soils, LID is especially challenging. Dry wells can help overcome this common obstacle and provide valuable water storage. This is an important strategy for climate change adaptation as well. Assisting communities in this work over the years, we've discovered that despite the MS4 requirements, LID and green infrastructure applications still remain piecemeal. More common, they're seen in cities or wealthy neighborhoods, and they tend to be more reactive than proactive. More often, they're expensive and time-consuming to complete, and they really don't have to be. These factors lead to resistance, especially among smaller, less resourced communities. They're afraid to embrace LID and GI projects, even though it's such a priority for the state, 
and required under regulations. We believe that by responding quickly, cost-effectively, and inclusively, whether in a big city or a small town, green infrastructure can become a viable tool for addressing the negative effects of urbanization, green equity, and the climate crisis. We call this new strategy tactical green infrastructure. The example pictured is California Avenue at UC Davis, where a team converted a thousand square feet of conventional lawn into both a rain garden and a drought tolerant landscape. They did this in only 10 weeks and for under $5,000. Tactical GI brings together design students and professional practitioners to identify, design, and construct small scale expedited green infrastructure projects. Emphasis on small and expedited. We target both paved and existing underutilized green space and turn it into highly functioning drought and flood tolerant landscapes in just a few months. This highly interactive process enlists volunteers, procures donated materials, and identifies potential project funding sources. It also helps to educate the public on basic principles of green infrastructure and sustainable stormwater management. Another successful example of tactical GI is the Morro Bay Boat Wash Pocket Park. This project had a strong focus on equity and meeting the needs of underserved or underrepresented community members. In this case, it was senior citizens seeking respite on their outings to visit Morro Bay from the nearby senior center. With grant funding from the Great Urban Parks Program and a partnership between multiple city departments and local community groups, we were able to convert some excess parking spaces into a pocket park that doubled as a stormwater feature, capturing runoff from the adjacent boat wash and treating it before it entered the bay. What's not yet pictured is the bench that is still on back order, which will be installed, providing the much needed respite for those senior citizens. The bench is the one thing they really wanted and we're gonna make sure they get it. A major tenet of LID and a high priority for the state of California is community engagement and planning. We believe that inclusivity, accessibility, and shared decision-making are fundamental to developing resilient communities. This is why we've anchored the tactical GI approach in our principles of equitable engagement. You too can empower marginalized voices to be co-creators in local green infrastructure projects. I encourage all of you to incorporate community expertise into every phase of your projects including how we define local needs and conditions, as well as how we develop and implement solutions, and of course, how we prioritize resource allocations and how we assess project impacts. We're doing this now in partnership with the Kasumnes Community Services District to design and build a nature park for the community, but especially to benefit students at an adjacent special needs school. We had a very robust in-person community engagement plan and had to pivot to virtual engagement at the start of COVID, as I'm sure many of you have had to do. We strive for maximum accessibility despite this new platform, and through the process, we learned quite a bit. We actually produced yet another resource for you, a best practices guide to virtual engagement. Here is a list of links to resources referenced in the presentation, including LGC's funding navigation tool and the state's grant portal. I encourage you to peruse those in particular and try and find some resources to fund your next green infrastructure, low impact development stormwater project. Also feel free to share these resources more broadly with the rest of your network. Please reach out to me directly if you're interested in working with us to deploy tactical GI broadly across the state. We're currently looking for funding to implement more pilot projects to demonstrate the efficacy of our approach and to bring these benefits to a community near you. I look forward to our discussion following the presentations. And with that, I'll turn it back over to our moderator, Carrie Pollard, to introduce our next panelist. Thank you, Danielle. Um, as you can see in the chat, LGC has a, a number of um, resources and tools that, they, that they've compiled. Um, and so I hope you, you all can take a look at those. Um, and, and in addition, I'll mention that um, this, we wanna welcome everyone. So apologies for Zoom, uh, the Zoom glitch. 
Um, those of you who may have missed the keynote um, and maybe the beginning of Daniel's presentation, it will be it has been recorded and it will be will be um, made available to our registered attendees. Folks can um, can have access to that via an email that our executive director Catherine Chandler will send out um, following the conference. Um, let's see. Up next, we have uh, Dr. Andrew Fisher to discuss how farmers and water utilities can collaborate on recharge, uh, recharging groundwater. Dr. Fisher is a distinguished professor of earth and planetary sciences at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He's the founder of the Recharge Initiative, which is a focused effort to protect, enhance, and improve the availability and reliability of groundwater resources. Um, I do want to remind everyone that um, we are using the Q&A function because this is a webinar, so um, feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A function at the, the bottom of your, your um, Zoom screen there. And our panelists are here and ready to answer those questions as they come in. Um, and so we will see if William is ready to start Andrew's presentation. Thank you. I'm Andy Fisher from UC Santa Cruz, and I'm going to be talking today about using stormwater to enhance groundwater recharge and several aspects of multiple programs that I'm participating in along with colleagues at UC Santa Cruz and other institutions. I'll acknowledge my co-authors here, including several former and current students. Groundwater recharge is the primary mechanism by which surface water becomes groundwater. It can occur in a variety of ways, including through irrigation returns and dedicated recharge basins. Groundwater recharge occurs both naturally across the landscape and it can be enhanced by human activities. It's the largest inflow into aquifers but it's also one of the most difficult hydrologic flows to measure. It can have an impact on water quality as well as supply, and it's strongly influenced by land use and climate. California groundwater supplies are facing a triple threat. Increasing demand is something with which we're all familiar, but two other processes are having an impact as well. Changes in land use in association with urbanization, ag development, and other activities, and a greater percentage of rainfall falling during a smaller number of more intense storms each year. These last two both tend to generate more runoff and therefore less infiltration and less recharge. As a result, these all have an impact that's negative on groundwater resources. Groundwater supplies or quantity are intimately tied with groundwater quality. The diagram on the left shows groundwater level changes from monitoring wells during a 10 year period, including the recent drought. The wells that are in red and orange have the greatest decrease in groundwater levels. And the diagram on the right shows water quality using nitrate nitrogen concentration the wells that are marked in red have concentrations above the maximum contaminant level, and even those in yellow are impacted by human activity. We do a lot of our work in the Central Coast hydrologic region of California, and this is the part of the state that uses groundwater for a greater percentage of freshwater demand than any other part of the state. That's for several reasons. First, this part of the state is essentially off the grid in terms of major intrastate transfers of water. But in addition, we have no major rivers or reservoirs, and there's no winter snowpack to provide supply in the spring and summer. So that's both an opportunity, but it's also a challenge. We've been working on an integrated program to enhance groundwater recharge including mapping and modeling to figure out where water might be available 
and then helping to design projects that can collect water and get it into the ground, document the benefits to both supply and quality, try to improve water quality, and then provide an incentive program which will encourage participation. I'm not gonna have time to cover all of that today, so I'm really gonna touch on sort of three major uh, topics about creating and measuring field projects and what their supply benefits are, and then incentives that can help to encourage similar projects. There's many forms of managed recharge with which you may be familiar, including spreading water across large areas, using dry wells, and so forth. The two kind of end members for managed aquifer recharge are low impact development and regional spreading grounds. LID projects tend to be located close to the source where runoff is generated. Regional spreading grounds will bring in large quantities of water, often over great distance or in association with recycling, and then uh, percolate that water into the ground or inject it. Uh, it's typically through heavily engineered projects. Low impact development projects tend to generate on the order of one or a few acre feet per year per project site. In contrast, regional spreading grounds can put as much as tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of acre feet per year into the ground per program. We're working at an intermediate scale with distributed stormwater collection going to MAR. That is, we're trying to generate on the order of 100 to a few hundred or a thousand acre feet per year per project site. The Pajaro Valley groundwater basin um, is located along California's central coast, adjacent to Monterey Bay. It's shown here in the orange area. Um, this area irrigates about 30,000 uh, acres and grows a lot of high value crops, including these delicious red berries, uh, organic uh, fruits and vegetables, flowers, and, and other crops. Overdraft is a problem in this area because pumping exceeds the sustainable yield for the basin. The city of Watsonville is the largest single pumper, but the, ma the majority of pumpage supports irrigated agriculture. And the overdraft is on the order of 20 to 40% of pumping each year. As a result, there has been seawater intrusion along the coast and a number of wells in this area have had to, been turn, have, have, have had to be turned off because they could no longer supply water with a salt content low enough that it could be used for agriculture or potable use. So here's a couple of examples of distributed stormwater collection MAR projects using, using stormwater. This is Boca Riza Ranch. It's a working ranch. You can see the landscape on the right. Drainage area is about 170 acres. Water is routed through a series of canals and there is a sediment detention basin and then eventually into an infiltration basin of about four acres. The overall project goal here uh, is to get on the order of 100 acre feet per year into the ground. This is nine years of monitoring data from the site. The first three years when we were involved were the first three years of the recent drought. If we set those years aside, there's a lot of variability still, but on average, we've met the project goal of about 100 acre feet per year of water diverted and infiltrated into the ground. You can also see quite a bit of variability year to year, even with similar rainfall. And this has a lot to do with how close together and how intense the rainstorms are. This is another project site on Kelly Thompson Ranch. This is a, another working ranch. In this case, the drainage area is about 1,300 acres, uh, drains into a 15-acre parcel, and then part of that has been set up for stormwater collection and infiltration. Here's an engineering drawing for that project as it was designed. Um, you can see the infiltration basin to the left and a sediment detention basin to the right. Also the colorful polygons there in the middle of the basin, those indicate different soil amendments that were added. 
in an effort to improve water quality as that water infiltrates into the ground. Here are some photographs from the site as the system was being built in the fall of 2019. Four acre infiltration basin on your left, the sediment detention basin on the right. Um, the photo on the lower left shows the um, carbon rich soil amendments being added and tilled into the soil. And then on the lower right, you can see some of the instrumentation we put out to monitor this system with data logging, but also real time telemetry so that we could plan for field campaigns. This shows some of our um, work in the field. One of the PhD students shown here collecting water samples. Water is collected from the surface, but also from the subsurface using instruments that were put in when the system was dry. And then we go out when it's raining or soon after a rain event and water is flowed into the basin. And we can pull samples from below the ground, including from below these carbon rich soil amendments to see how much water quality has been improved. So this system ran for the first time last year. It generated about 100 acre feet of infiltration benefit, even though it was a relatively dry year. And we also have documented improvements to water quality during infiltration. That's ongoing work, which hopefully we'll be able to report more fully soon. Here's a quick overview, though, of water quality um, compared between the surface runoff and groundwater. On the left are data from groundwater wells. The yellow and red bars are from nearby shallow groundwater wells. The shorter green bar on the left is from a large number of regional groundwater wells. You can see they all have elevated nitrate concentrations, uh, particularly the local wells. In contrast, the runoff shown on the right with the, with the blue and purple bars, um, much lower concentrations of nitrate nitrogen, much better than the ambient groundwater. In addition, we've done field and lab studies to test the impact of the soil amendments. Here is one example, one of those studies. Um, this shows the fraction of nitrate removed plotted against the incoming nitrate load. That's the product of the infiltration rate and the initial nitrate concentration. The black dots and the dashed line indicate the net removal of nitrate nitrogen for the native soil. You get more nitrate removed as a fraction when it's a lower load, uh, but you get a big improvement in the nitrate removal, and this is mainly through denitrification when the soil is supplemented with bioavailable carbon, either as a wood chip layer or a 50-50 mix of wood chip and native soil. So this seems like a good idea. Why aren't we doing more of it? Well, there are barriers that may limit participation in distributed stormwater collection for managed recharge. One is that this kind of project can take land out of production or limit access to other property, create crop impacts, or even uh, concerns for liability. There's also ongoing maintenance as shown in these photos. On the left, sediment that's collected within an infiltration basin, and on the right, some debris collected at the inlet to an infiltration basin. So what can be done to limit the impacts of having a project like this on one's property? Well, there's a working model that we can that we can work with, and that is net energy metering, which was used quite successfully um, by energy utilities. The concept here is that a solar panel or a set of panels are put on a roof and they generate power. If there's more power generated than is used, then the excess can be put on the grid. And when that occurs, it allows the uh, meter to be run backwards. In essence, uh, the value of that energy is refunded to the stakeholder. So a program like this requires mainly there be reliable measurement and accounting, there be a formula to calculate the benefit, and then there has to be trust for an agreement between the agency and the stakeholders that are involved. So how would something like that work for groundwater recharge? So imagine this scenario, 75 irrigated acres, growing delicious red berries. So we need two and a half feet of applied water per year. This is an area with annual precipitation of about a foot and a half and a fraction of runoff of 0.4. That seems high, but it's actually what we've measured for the most intense rainfall events at our uh, work sites. 
So imagine three scenarios where you've got drainage areas of 200, 400, or 600 acres, and then imagine that an area equivalent to 1% of that size was available for infiltration and recharge, two, four, or six acres. In the Pajaro Valley, the pumping augmentation fee is relatively high on the order of $250 per acre foot. Imagine that the rebate for this program is 50% of net infiltration. So here's how the scenario plays out in terms of water. For a grower who does not participate on the left, there's about 190 acre feet of net pumpage and there's no extra infiltration. For all the rest of the scenarios, the pink bars indicate gross runoff and then the green bar is the net runoff after accounting for what would have soaked into the ground anyhow um, for that land area. So in the case of 200 acres of drainage, there's about um, two thirds of um, the amount of pumpage is collected as runoff. And so the net pumpage is reduced on the order of 60 acre feet. So they're still pumping water, but they're pumping less when you account for the infiltration that's been created. For the two ranches on the right with drainage areas of 400 to 600 acres, they have so much infiltration from collected runoff that their net pumpage is negative, minus 60 and minus about 190 acre feet. Here's how that plays out in terms of cost. For the grower who doesn't participate, their water cost is $46,000 per year. For the grower who drains, uh, collects drainage from 200 acres, their water cost is reduced to 31,000. They get a $15,000 per year rebate. For the grower who drains 400 acres, their rebate is even higher, more than $30,000. And now their water cost is 15,000 per year. And finally, for the grower who drains 600 acres, in fact, their rebate is so large that after they pump water and grow their berries, they also get a check from the agency for $800. So we helped to launch a recharge net metering program in the Pajaro Valley. The long-term goal is to build it out to about a thousand acre feet per year of recharge benefit. Um, it's a relatively small uh, goal, a relatively uh, modest goal, but one thing we're interested in is how this could be scaled up to work in other places and maybe generate even more benefit. The Resource Conservation District of Santa Cruz County and we at UC Santa Cruz act as a third party certifier for the program helping to find sites, find partners, raise funds for capital, get the projects put in, built for measurement. And then we work with the landowners and tenants to validate and certify performance. We report to the agency and then they calculate and apply the rebate. Right now there's two active projects and several more that are in development and additional sites are under investigation. At this stage, the main limit is our ability to evaluate the sites and then get the projects built. So in summary, managed aquifer recharge with stormwater can provide benefit and water that's available for irrigation, as well as non-extractive benefit and water that provides hydrologic system services. What's critical in designing and building these projects is that they're built for measurement so that we can document the benefits. Projects like this can improve water quality along with supply. And they do provide a range of additional benefits including those to habitat and aquatic systems. MAR um, using stormwater can be part of a successful portfolio. We would not suggest that it can solve California's groundwater challenges, but I think it's a valuable addition to other methods that are applied in order to sustain and secure water resources going forward. With that, I want to acknowledge the primary funding agencies who have supported different aspects of this work over the years, and I'm happy to answer questions you may have when the time is right. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Uh, that, that was a great uh, couple of examples of opportunities for you know, farmers and water utilities to, to collaborate to the benefit of all, and I think it was a really great example. Um, Dr. Fisher came to me via um, Valley Waters uh, 
interest in in uh, credits when working with farmers. So that's a great resource, and uh, you can check out his website, the uh, RechargeInitiative.org, um, to get more information. Okay, our next and our, our final presenter um, on our on our joint panel here is um, Glenn Drown with Lidco Inc. So Glenn has been in the drainage business, removing excess water from fields for over 42 years. He owns a licensed mountain spring water source in the mountains of San Diego County. And he actually had a bottling company, a water bottling company from 2000 through 2011. But now he works to um, put water back in the ground via recharge systems. Uh, water has been a big part of his life, even though he never planned it that way. Um, and now he's going to share with us some recharge projects that they've installed and provide some opportunities that he's seen in the shifting industry um, based on his experience. Uh, continue your participation via the Q&A. Again, use that Q&A function down on the bottom or the chat function if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question or um, make a comment or, or other, other inquiry. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and start Glenn's presentation. Thank you, William. Good morning. I hope we're all happy after some rain. All happy after some rain. At least at the time I recorded this, it looked like there would be rain. Um, I grew up in the farming community of Imperial Valley. And after some time at Cal Poly, I took a job back in the valley cleaning tile, doing a, running a maintenance business for tile drainage systems. In 1979, I went to work for Lidco installing drainage systems as an assistant to the founding manager, Willie Taylor. Uh, since 1988, I've run the operation, business operations from Bakersfield to the coast, to uh, Delta and on up now, we're working up into the Sacramento Valley and Calusa and Redding. Agriculture is an amazing diverse industry in this state, and I'm very proud to have helped farmers across the entire state improve their land productivity and in turn their livelihood. Growing crops in areas that one would never have thought of 20 years ago is been an interesting and fun experience. Lidco was founded in 1960 to install farm drainage known then as tiling because red clay and concrete pipes had been used in decades before and that moniker has continued. Lidco began manufacturing its own HDPE pipe, high density polyethylene, in 1966 when they imported an extruder from Germany. They had looked for other options, some way, something other than the red clay and the concrete pipes that weren't friendly uh, and easy to do. Um, we currently have a fleet of 13 installation machines, no longer in the pipe manufacturing business, sold that. But uh, we've installed over 85 million feet of drainage in the Southwest United States. We've done some work in Saudi Arabia and in Mexico. The purpose for tile drains is to remove excess water from the soil allowing plant roots to breathe and flourish. By removing water from the soil, farmers are able to augment conditions for optimal growth of crops and thereby increasing yields. This is especially important to the Sacramento Delta area and has allowed farmers to raise permanent crops there where they hadn't been able to previously. The idea of recharge was brought to me by an engineer named Mark Koch with NextGen Utility Management. I'd been working with Mark on a drainage system up in the Calusa area. 
he called one day to discuss his idea about how to put excess water into the ground for recharging the aquifer. And I was driving down the road at the time listening in my pickup. His thought was to install the lines just as we typically do for drainage, but to change the slope. As you can see on this, make it similar to a septic system and reverse the grade from the drainage system. Uh, a sump structure would be used, which typically in a drainage system, a sump is used to pump water out of the ground where we don't have a gravity flow situation, but in his case, it would be used to put water into the ground and into the back into the drainage system that's graded in reverse. Um, we spoke about this concept for about 30 minutes on the phone and when he was done, why he asked if it passed my laugh test. I told him I wasn't laughing and that this could be a terrific option for landowners rather than retiring the land, building surface ponds, and taking property off of the tax rolls. I was pretty excited about the idea and it really fit well with the equipment and the business model that, that we have and what our crews do. Um, it was only about three weeks later that I received a call from a Kern County customer that I had installed some drainage work for and he wanted to discuss a tile line in the roadway adjacent to his almonds and he wanted to use that to exfiltrate water. Same idea that Mark had given me three weeks previously but this customer wasn't aware or didn't have the thought of putting it into a whole field. I explained the idea of just spreading lateral lines out across the field and having the distribution of water across the whole field. Um, he gave some thought to that. We ran some numbers, talked about it, and he approved, he had a 40 acre new vineyard going in, so in May of 2017 we completed it and he began pumping uh, 400, 450 gallons a minute. And this is that actual system shown on the slide and those light areas out in the field or where we had installed the tile lines, uh, nine feet, nine and a half feet deep. And you can see on the right, in the summer of 2017, the water flowing in to the box. He was pumping water through a temporary pipe and into the distribution box for recharge into the ground. To date, we have installed 16 projects, some of them consisting of multiple systems. A couple of projects have five individual systems, one has six or eight, um, and others are smaller, just single systems. The, uh, as you can see on the graphic, 13 of them are going into new development almond orchards to to vineyards and we do have one that's in row crops customer wanted to be flexible with his ground but still have the ability to recharge the projects have covered 1580 acres and the flow capacity of the systems to date are approximately 54,000 gallons per minute uh, 120 cubic feet per second They're all based on the turnout, the water availability, and what's a, what uh, their current irrigation system, filtration system has, and the turnout from the district. Each individual system is varies fairly significantly. 
several of the systems installed in 2018 had the ability to put water in through late 2018 and into 2019. This one system was one customer system. It was 100 acres and five individual 20 acre systems on it. And there were a few points in time where you can see the lines flatten out where we weren't putting water in, or he wasn't putting water in, but um, the water district had water available and through about a 13 month period had put in about 1,800 acre feet in that year. The installation process can present be difficult because we're working in sandy soil. Uh, this is ground that I never thought we'd do any work with. Obviously with the drainage it's well drained, dry, no water table, no need for a drainage contractor. But Mark's idea just opened up a whole new territory for us and uh, new challenges as well. Uh, Banks Cave, it's very um, very challenging. You can see here on this slide digging at 12 feet and the banks cave off and we have twice the amount of spoil and um, in this instance why we can't get it away from the machine so we have to use excavators on each side. But down below we're installing the pipe with a three inch gravel envelope around it and you don't have an open ditch, you don't have an open trench. You just, it would be cost prohibitive to do it with an excavator and open and lay the pipe by hand in such sandy soils down at the depth that we're working at. As with anything new, you you learn things and you make changes along the way. Second project that we installed, that project you saw the graph of the water intake on. Uh, we learned not to use perforated mainline pipes. Heck, I thought you're running a pipe down there, put holes in it and let it go out into the ground as well as the lateral lines that go off to the side that are four inch diameter. And uh, we found out um, he, he decided to push the system and really test it and put a little more water in than what we had designed it for. And then that created some head pressure and with those perforations the water began to surface at the box, the sump box, the distribution box and three or four hundred feet into the field along the main line. Um, to resolve that, why he went in and put a second main line down halfway and carried it further down the main. But the thing that we learned was not to use perforated pipes. So we came across this flexible dual wall, um, interior, smooth interior. So that did two things for us. It gave us some good strength, extra strength, and a nice tight uh, uh, pipe to keep that doesn't exfiltrate. And these coils are 300 feet in length for a 12 inch pipe. So we don't have any couplers, don't have any place for it to leak. A second lesson that we learned was don't use too big a pipe on the lateral lines. The water moves freely down to the end and comes to the surface at the end. So you need to have some engineering done, calculations, and constrain the water so that it does move out through those perforations. What are the constraints? Well, to, the, to date, we haven't been brave enough to install any systems without running them through the filtration. Uh, there's 
silt and sediment, algae could pass through, come through the district turnouts and over a period of time could present a problem, some settling and reduced capacity in the, the, um, in the system. So, so we have tried to use, util, be able to utilize the existing orchard, vineyard, irrigation system. Typically you're not irrigating when there's recharge water available in the winter and the springtime. And even as it gets into spring and you begin irrigating, you're not irrigating all the time and so there's opportunity to utilize the system both for the recharge and for the irrigation and share the thing. You just operate the system longer. Um, some of the systems have installed standalone filtration. Uh, use a low uh, low powered uh, gravity screen filter and cleans off the algae and settles the silt and then comes directly into the to the system we also have one system that uh, pulls water from a canal and that system the filter station is being constructed now so we don't have the history as to how that's going to work but they've uh, tried some new filters and we'll be very curious to see how that uh, how that works taking water directly from the canal hopefully there will be some water available this year and, and we can find out how that works uh, that would allow for larger volumes larger you won't be constrained to the district turnout if you can pull water from a canal, if you happen to be located near a canal. And finally, on the maintenance side of it and constraints, if there was some silting and sediment, we have the ability to do the cleaning. At the beginning, I told you I started out working with a cleaning operation. So we have a cleaning rig available that we use on drainage systems. So we have mineral issues and silting, uh, iron ochre that forms because water's around the pipe all the time. We don't anticipate that with the recharge because water comes and it it's filtered and it's going in and it's pushing things out through the gravel envelope and into contact with the soil so but we do have that as a backup if we have any issues so. do i have good recharge soil you know by now most landowners have been thinking about sigma and what their situation is if they have sandy permeable soil, they're looking for the ability to recharge. Um, they know they need to take action and this is something that they can do to provide benefit to their own specific operation. You know, SAGB map provides some insight um, of soil closer to the surface. But with our system, we're starting. We're putting the lines down 9 to 13 feet below the surface. So we're typically below what the SAGB map addresses. And further measures are needed. Um, the water districts that we've worked with so far are requesting, and I think it's a good procedure, that several borings be made on each project site. Most of these borings are 50 foot of depth, but I do have some customers that have gone down to 100 foot and even I know of three, three bores that went to 150 feet on one project site. Um, knowing that the water will travel down and not build up into the root zone of the crop is critical prior to the capital expenditure of the system. So this goes a long ways to that. Uh, 
it also helps the engineer provide uh, have insight to the flow capacity of the soil you know how quickly is that water going to move away and move on down through the through the soil profile helps size the pipes as well how much water can move through it okay now we get to the heart of the story that's money you know what does it cost the numbers you see here are for the installation of the system itself underground there are still factors uh, filtration do you have existing filtration uh, you know other infrastructure that that may be needed monitoring uh, collecting the data those things that's not reflected in this uh, other things that impact the the range of what we have or, you know how much water is available to put in the ground uh, what do we need size wise for piping to get that water into the ground and how many acres does it need to cover and uh, what's the slope of the land impacts the sizing and flow and and what crop you know if you're putting a permanent crop we want to target the lines in the middle of the rows and that provides any access in the future if need be it seems to us that there's some good advantages of this concept over typical recharge whether it be flood mar flooding existing crops or even surface basins uh, we're keeping land in production the no evapotranspiration losses we're introducing the water down nine ten feet below the surface puts us beyond the fertilizers and other issues with the ground that cultural practices that we don't disturb uh, you could recharge this year round with snow melt sometimes it's late into the season when water is still available if there's a heavy snow year and snow melt runs late into the year uh, you can pick and choose locations it's distributed around the district and district can utilize it and put it where there's good soils and where they have water often the conveyance infrastructure gets taxed because the recharge happens all in one area and there's applications in other areas uh, parks golf courses any place where they would have access to to water surface water at times when it's available for recharge and not limited just just to farming what is needed to implement more of these more of these systems it uh, tile recharge doesn't have to be a private landowner venture as I just stated I kind of foresee maybe GSA's or you know several districts working together within the GSA and to fund these find willing landowners the private landowners can be compensated for the operation of the system and maybe get a little bit of credit for having the water under their ground um, but then the rest of the district can benefit as well of the di the just the rest of the water users in the district I'm sorry can benefit as well because it'll be distributed you know district wide when they need that water um, the district obviously is going to monitor and record the quantities put in and bank so that would uh, benefit everyone as you can tell I'm not a poly speaker and haven't done any speaking in many many years as far as public forum typically talk of one and one or in small groups but I thank you for the opportunity to provide a glimpse of something that can benefit the whole state you know, it's it's so difficult to create more surface storage and and recharge is a big thing buzzword now and taking retiring land isn't always a good option so hopefully this is uh, something that can be done and be virtually invisible after the installation 
So again, I thank you and look forward to comments and questions. Thank you, Glenn. I think that was a great example or a few examples of, of various opportunities um, that, that you know, we could consider implementing in a, in a wider scale across the state, as you mentioned. Um, I wanna thank all of our presenters for, um, for, for being here today and participating, and of course our attendees as well. As I mentioned, the video recording link will be emailed out to you. Um, so look for that in your inbox. And in addition, we'll have a survey to get some feedback on um, how this went. We do apologize for the technical difficulties that we had from the get-go, um, but, but rest assured that um, it should run much smoother from now on. Um, and again, tomorrow's links, tomorrow's sessions will be accessed via the same links you used today. We will now begin our breakout sessions. Um, and so the urban session will be in a separate room, and I believe that will be put into the chat. Um, in addition, it was in the email that was sent out when you registered, so you can find it in either of those locations. Um, the ag folks will stay here on this channel, um, and then again, the over folks will jump over to the other channel. And I will now turn the stage over to my fellow CII director, Tom Duvall. So Tom, if you want to um, mic on, camera on, and I'll turn this over to you. 